the jovian jest by lilith lorraine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the jovian jest by lilith lorraine consternation reigned in elsner village when the nameless thing was discovered in farmer burns corn patch when the rumor began to gain credence that it was some sort of meteor from interstellar space reporters scientists and college professors flocked to the scene desirous of prying off particles for analysis but they soon discovered that the thing was no ordinary meteor for it glowed at night with a peculiar luminescence they also observed that it was practically weightless since it had embedded itself in the soft sand scarcely more than a few inches by the time the first group of newspapermen and scientists had reached the farm another phenomena was plainly observable the thing was growing farmer burns with an eye for profit had already built a picket fence around his starry visitor and was charging admission he also flatly refused to permit the chipping off of specimens or even touching of the object his attitude was severely criticized but he stubbornly clung to the theory that possession is nine points in law it was professor ralston of princewell who on the third day after the fall of the meteor remarked upon its growth his colleagues crowded around him as he pointed out this peculiarity and soon they discovered another factor pulsation larger than a small balloon and gradually almost imperceptibly expanding with its viscid transparency shot through with opalescent lights the thing lay there in the deepening twilight and palpably shivered as darkness descended a sort of hellish radiance began to ooze from it i say hellish because there's no other word to describe that spectral sulphurous emanation as the hangers-on around the pickets shudderingly shrank away from the weird light that was streaming out to them and tinting their faces with a ghastly greenish pallor farmer burns small boy moved by some imp of perversity did a characteristically childish thing he picked up a good-sized stone and flung it straight at the nameless mass instead of veering off and falling to the ground as from an impact with metal the stone sank right through the surface of the thing as into a pool of protoplasmic slime when it reached the central core of the object a more abundant life suddenly leaped and pulsed from centre to circumference visible waves of sentient colour circled round the solid stone stabbing swords of light leaped forth from them piercing the stone crumbling it absorbing it when it was gone only a red spot like a bloodshot eye throbbed eerily where it had been before the now thoroughly mystified crowd had time to remark upon this inexplicable disintegration a more horrible manifestation occurred the thing as though thoroughly awakened and vitalized by its unusual fare was putting forth a tentacle right from the top of the shivering globe it pushed sluggishly weaving a precedent of doom wavering it hung for a moment turning twisting groping finally it shot straight outward stiff as a rattler's strike before the closely packed crowd could give room for escape it had circled the neck of the nearest bystander bill jones a cattleman and jerked him writhing and screaming into the reddish core stupefied with soul-chilling terror with the mass consciousness practically annihilated before a deed with which their minds could make no association the crowd could only gasp in sobbing unison and await the outcome the absorption of the stone had taught them what to expect and for a moment it seemed clear that their worst anticipations were to be realized the sluggish current circled through the thing swirling the victim's body to the centre the giant tentacle drew back into the globe and became itself a current the concentric circles merged tightened became one gleaming cord that encircled the helpless prey from the inner circumference of this cord shot forth not the swords of light that had powdered the stone to atoms but myriads of radiant tentacles that gripped and cupped the body in a thousand places suddenly the tentacles withdrew themselves all save the ones that grasped the head these seemed to tighten their pressure 
to swell and pulse with a grayish substance that was flowing from the cups into the cord and from the cord into the body of the mass yes it was a grayish something a smoke-like essence that was being drawn from the cranial cavity bill jones was no longer screaming and gibbering but was stiff with the rigidity of a stone notwithstanding there was no visible mark upon his body his flesh seemed unharmed swiftly came the awful climax the waving tentacles withdrew themselves the body of bill jones lost its rigidity a heaving motion from the center of the thing propelled its cargo to the surface and bill jones stepped out yes he stepped out and stood for a moment staring straight ahead staring at nothing glassily every person in the shivering paralyzed group knew instinctively that something unthinkable had happened to him something had transpired something hitherto possible only in the abysmal spaces of the other side of things finally he turned and faced the nameless object raising his arm stiffly automatically as in a military salute then he turned and walked jerkily mindlessly round and round the globe like a wooden soldier marching meanwhile the thing lay quiescent gorged professor ralston was the first to find his voice in fact professor ralston was always finding his voice in the most unexpected places but this time it had caught a chill it was trembling gentlemen he began looking down academically upon the motley crowd as though doubting the aptitude of his salutation fellow citizens he corrected the phenomena we just witnessed is to the lay mind inexplicable to me and to my honorable colleagues added as an afterthought it is quite clear quite clear indeed we have before us a specimen a perfect specimen i might say of a of a he stammered in the presence of the unnameable his hesitancy caused the rapt attention of the throng that was waiting breathlessly for an explanation to flicker back to the inexplicable in the fraction of a second that their gaze had been diverted from the thing to the professor the object had shot forth another tentacle, gripping him round the neck and choking off his sentence with a horrid rasp that sounded like a death rattle. Needless to say, the revolting process that had turned Bill Jones from a human being into a mindless automaton was repeated with Professor Ralston. It happened as before, too rapidly for intervention, too suddenly for the minds of the onlookers to shake off the paralysis of an unprecedented nightmare but when the victim was thrown to the surface when he stepped out drained of the grayish smoke-like essence a tentacle still gripped his neck and another rested directly on top of his head this latter tentacle instead of absorbing from him visibly poured into him what resembled a thread-like stream of violet light facing the cowering audience with eyes staring glassily still in the grip of the unknowable professor ralston did an unbelievable thing he resumed his lecture at the exact point of interruption but he spoke with the tonelessness of a machine a machine that pulsed to the will of a dictator inhuman and inexorable what you see before you the voice continued the voice that no longer echoed the thoughts of the professor is what you would call an amoeba a giant amoeba it is i this amoeba who am addressing you children of an alien universe it is i who through this captured instrument of expression whose queer language you can understand am explaining my presence on your planet i pour my thoughts into this specialized brain box which i have previously drained of its meager thought content here the honorable colleagues nudged each other gleefully i have so drained it for the purpose of analysis and that the flow of my own ideas may pass from my mind to yours unimpeded by any distortion that might otherwise be caused by their conflict with the thoughts of this individual first i absorbed the brain content of this being whom you call bill jones but i found his mental instrument unavailable it was technically untrained in the use of your words that would best convey my meaning he possesses more of what you would call an innate intelligence but he has not perfected the mechanical brain through whose operation this innate intelligence can be transmitted to others and applied for practical advantage 
now this creature that i am using is as you might say full of sound without meaning his brain is a lumber room in which he has hoarded a conglomeration of clever and appropriate word forms with which to disguise the paucity of his ideas with which to express nothing yet the very abundance of the material in his storeroom furnishes a discriminating mind with excellent tools for the transportation of its ideas into other minds know then that i am not here by accident i am a space wanderer an explorer from a super universe whose evolution has proceeded without variation along the line of your amoeba your evolution as i perceive from an analysis of the brain content of your professor began its unfoldment in somewhat the same manner as our own but in your smaller system less perfectly adjusted than our own to the cosmic mechanism a series of cataclysms occurred in fact your planetary system was itself the result of a catastrophe or of what might have been a catastrophe had the two great suns collided whose near approach caused the wrenching off of your planets from this colossal accident rare indeed in the annals of the stars an endless chain of accidents was born a chain of which this specimen this professor and the species that he represents is one of the weakest links your infinite variety of species is directly due to the variety of adaptations necessitated by this train of accidents in the super universe from which i come such derangements of the celestial machinery simply do not happen for this reason our evolution has unfolded harmoniously along one line of development whereas yours has branched out into diversified and grotesque expressions of the life principle your so-called highest manifestation of this principle namely your own species is characterized by a great number of specialized organs through this very specialization of functions however you have fortified your own individual immortality and it has come about that only your life stream is immortal the primal cell is inherently immortal but death follows in the wake of specialization we the beings of this amoeba universe are individually immortal we have no highly specialized organs to break down under the stress of environment when we want an organ we create it when it has served its purpose we withdraw it into ourselves we reach out our tentacles and draw to ourselves whatsoever we desire should a tentacle be destroyed we can put forth another our universe is beautiful beyond the dreams of your most inspired poets whereas your landscapes though lovely are stationary unchanging except through herculean efforts ours are protean eternally changing with our own substance we build our minarets of light piercing the aura of infinity at the bidding of our wills we create preserve destroy only to build again more gloriously we draw our sustenance from the primates as do your plants and we constantly replace the electronic base of these primates with our own emanations in much the same manner as your nitrogenous plants revitalize your soil while we create and withdraw organs at will we have nothing to correspond to your five senses we derive knowledge through one sense only or shall i say a super sense we see and hear and touch and taste and smell and feel and know not through any one organ but through our whole structure the homogeneous force of our omni substance subjects the plural world to the processing of a powerful unity we can dissolve our bodies at will retaining only the permanent atom of our being the seed of life dropped on the soil of our planet by infinite intelligence we can propel this indestructible seed on light rays through the depths of space we can visit the farthest universe with the velocity of light since light is our conveyance in reaching your little world i have consumed a million years for my world is a million light years distant yet to my race a million years is as one of your days on arrival at any given destination we can build our bodies from the elements of the foreign planet 
we attain our knowledge of conditions on any given planet by absorbing the thought content of the brains of the few representative members of its dominant race every well-balanced mind contains the experience of the race the essence of the wisdom that the race soul has gained during its residence in matter we make this knowledge a part of our own thought content and thus the universe lies like an open book before us at the end of a given experiment in thought absorption we return the borrowed mind stuff to the brain of its possessor we reward our subject for his momentary discomfiture by pouring into his body our splendid vitality this lengthens his life expectancy immeasurably by literally burning from his system the germs of actual or incipient ills that contaminate the bloodstream. This, I believe, will conclude my explanation, an explanation to which you, as a race in whom intelligence is beginning to dawn, are entitled. But you have a long road to travel yet. Your thought channels are pitifully blocked and crisscrossed with nonsensical and inhibitory complexes that stand in the way of true progress but you will work this out for the divine spark that pulses through us of the larger universe pulses also through you that spark once lighted can never be extinguished can never be swallowed up again in the primeval slime there is nothing more that i can learn from you nothing that i can teach you at this stage of your evolution i have but one message to give you one thought to leave with you forge on you are on the path the stars are over you their light is flashing into your souls the slogan of the federated suns beyond the frontiers of your little warring worlds forge on the voice died out like the chiming of a great bell receding into immeasurable distance the superfluous tones of the professor had yielded to the sweetness and the light of the greater mind whose instrument he had momentarily become it was charged at the last with a golden resonance that seemed to echo down vast spaceless corridors beyond the furthermost outposts of time as the voice faded out into the sacramental silence the strangely assorted throng moved by a common impulse lowered their heads as though in prayer the great globe pulsed and shimmered through its sentient depths like a sea of liquid jewels then the tentacle that grasped the professor drew him back towards the scintillating nucleus. Simultaneously, another arm reached out and grasped Bill Jones, who, during the strange lecture, had ceased his wooden soldier marching and had stood stiffly at attention. The bodies of both men within the nucleus were encircled once more by the single current. From it again put forth the tentacles, cupping their heads, but the smoke-like essence flowed back into them this time, and with it flowed a tiny thread-like stream of violet light. Then came the heaving motion when the shimmering currents caught the two men, and tossed them forth, unharmed, but visibly dowered within the radiance of more abundant life. Their faces were positively glowing, and their eyes were illuminated by a light that was surely not of earth. Then, before the very eyes of the marveling people, the great globe began to dwindle the jeweled lights intensified concentrated merged until at last remained only a single spot no larger than a pinhead but whose radiance was notwithstanding searing excruciating then the spot leaped up up into the heavens whirling dipping and circling as in a gesture of farewell and finally soaring into invisibility with the blinding speed of light the whole wildly improbable occurrence might have been dismissed as a queer case of mass delusion for such cases are not unknown to history had it not been followed by a convincing aftermath the culmination of a series of startling coincidences both ridiculous and tragic at last brought men face to face with an incontestable fact namely that bill jones had emerged from his fiery baptism endowed with the thought-expressing facilities of Professor Ralston, while the professor was forced to struggle along with the meager educational appliances of Bill Jones. In this ironic manner, the space wanderer had left unquestionable proof of his visit by rendering a tribute to innate intelligence and playing a Jovian jest upon an educated fool. 
a neat transposition. A Columbus from a vaster, kindlier universe had paused for a moment to learn the story of our pygmy system. He had brought us a message from the outermost citadels of life, and had flashed out again on his aeonic voyage from everlasting unto everlasting. End of The Jovian Jest by Lilith Lorraine Keep Your Shape by Robert Sheckley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen Keep Your Shape by Robert Sheckley Only a race as incredibly elastic as the Grom could have a single rule of war. Pid the pilot slowed the ship almost to a standstill, and peered anxiously at the green planet below. Even without instruments there was no mistaking it. Third from its sun, it was the only planet in this system capable of sustaining life. Peacefully it swam beneath its gauze of clouds. It looked very innocent, and yet twenty previous Grom expeditions had set out to prepare this planet for invasion, and vanished utterly without a word. Pid hesitated only a moment, before starting irrevocably down. There was no point in hovering and worrying. He and his two crewmen were as ready now as they would ever be. Their compact displacers were stored in body pouches, inactive, but ready. Pid wanted to say something to his crew, but wasn't sure how to put it. The crew waited. Ilg, the radio man, had sent the final message to the Grom planet. Gur, the detector, read sixteen dials at once, and reported... No sign of alien activity. His body surfaces flowed carelessly. Noticing the flow, Pid knew what to say to his crew. Ever since they had left Grom, shape discipline had been disgustingly lax. The invasion chief had warned him, but still he had to do something about it. It was his duty, since lower castes, such as radio men and detectors, were notoriously prone to shapelessness. A lot of hopes are resting on this expedition, he began slowly. We're a long way from home now. Gur the detector nodded. Ilg the radio man flowed out of his prescribed shape and molded himself comfortably to a wall. However, Pid said sternly, distance is no excuse for promiscuous shapelessness. Ilg flowed hastily back into proper radio man's shape. Exotic forms will undoubtedly be called for, Pid went on, and for that we have a special dispensation. But remember... Any shape not assumed strictly in the line of duty is a foul, lawless device of the shapeless one. Gur's body surfaces abruptly stopped flowing. That's all, Pid said, and flowed into his controls. The ship started down, so smoothly coordinated that Pid felt a glow of pride. They were good workers, he decided. He just couldn't expect them to be as shape-conscious as a high-caste pilot. Even the invasion chief had told him that. Pid, the invasion chief, had said at their last interview, We need this planet, desperately. Yes, sir, Pid had said, standing at full attention, never quivering from optimum pilot shape. One of you, the chief said heavily, must get through, and set up a displacer near an atomic power source. The army will be standing by at this end, ready to step through. We'll do it, sir, Pid said. This expedition has to succeed, the chief said, and his features blurred momentarily from sheer fatigue. In strictest confidence, there's considerable unrest on Grom. The minor caste is on strike, for instance. They want a new digging shape, say the old one is inefficient. Pid looked properly indignant. The mining shape had been set down by the ancients 50,000 years ago, together with the rest of the basic shapes, and now these upstarts wanted to change it. That's not all, the chief told him. We've uncovered a new cult of shapelessness. Picked up almost 8,000 grom, and I don't know how many more we missed. Pid knew that shapelessness was a lure of the shapeless one, the greatest evil that the grom mind could conceive of. But why, he wondered, did so many grom fall for his lures? The chief guessed his question. Pid, he said, I suppose it's difficult for you to understand. Do you enjoy piloting? Yes, sir, Pid said simply. Enjoy piloting? It was his entire life. Without a ship, 
He was nothing. Not all Grom feel that way, the chief said. I don't understand it either. All my ancestors have been invasion chiefs, back to the beginning of time. So, of course, I want to be an invasion chief. It's only natural, as well as lawful. But the lower castes don't feel that way. The chief shook his body sadly. I've told you this for a reason. We Grom need more room. This unrest is caused purely by crowding. Another planet to expand into will cure everything. So we're counting on you, Pid. Yes, sir, Pid said, with a glow of pride. The chief rose to end the interview. Then he changed his mind and sat down again. You'll have to watch your crew, he said. They're loyal, no doubt, but low caste. And you know the lower castes. Pid did, indeed. Gur, your detector, is suspected of harboring alterationist tendencies. He was once fined for assuming a quasi-hunter shape. Ilg has never had any definite charge brought against him, but I hear that he remains immobile for suspiciously long periods of time. Possibly he fancies himself a thinker. But, sir, Pid protested, if they are even slightly tainted with alterationism or shapelessness, why send them on this expedition? The chief hesitated before answering. There are plenty of Grom I could trust, he said slowly, but those two have certain qualities of resourcefulness and imagination that will be needed on this expedition. He sighed. I really don't understand why those qualities are usually linked with shapelessness. Yes, sir, Pid said. Just watch them. Yes, sir, Pid said again, and saluted, realizing that the interview was at an end. In his body pouch, he felt the dormant displacer, ready to transform the enemy's power source into a bridge across space for the Grom hordes. Good luck, the chief said. I'm sure you'll need it. The ship dropped silently toward the surface of the enemy planet. Gur the detector analyzed the clouds below and fed data into the camouflage unit. The unit went to work. Soon the ship looked, to all outward appearances, like a cirrus formation. Pid allowed the ship to drift slowly toward the surface of the mystery planet. He was in optimum pilot shape now, the most efficient of the four shapes allotted to the pilot cast. Blind, deaf, and dumb, an extension of his controls, all his attention was directed toward matching the velocities of the high-flying clouds, staying among them, becoming a part of them. Gur remained rigidly in one of the two shapes allotted to detectors. He fed data into the camouflage unit, and the descending ship slowly altered into an altocumulus. There was no sign of activity from the enemy planet. Ilg located an atomic power source and fed the data to Pid. The pilot altered course. He had reached the lowest level of clouds, barely a mile above the surface of the planet. Now his ship looked like a flat, fleecy cumulus. And still there was no sign of alarm. The unknown fate that had overtaken twenty previous expeditions still had not showed itself. Dusk crept across the face of the planet as Pid maneuvered near the atomic power installation. He avoided the surrounding homes and hovered over a clump of woods. Darkness fell, and the green planet's lone moon was veiled in clouds. One cloud floated lower, and landed. Quick, everyone out, Pid shouted, detaching himself from the ship's controls. He assumed the pilot's shape best suited for running, and raced out of the hatch. Gur and Ilg hurried after him. They stopped fifty yards from the ship, and waited. Inside the ship, a little used circuit closed. There was a silent shudder, and the ship began to melt. Plastic dissolved, metal crumpled. Soon the ship was a great pile of junk, and still the process went on. Big fragments broke into smaller fragments and split, and split again. Pid felt suddenly helpless, watching his ship scuttle itself. He was a pilot, of the pilot cast. His father had been a pilot, and his father before him, stretching back to the hazy past when the Grom had first constructed ships. He had spent his entire childhood around ships, his entire manhood flying them. Now shipless, he was naked in an alien world. In a few minutes there was only a mound of dust to show where the ship had been. The night wind scattered it through the forest, and then there was nothing at all. They waited. Nothing happened. The wind sighed and the trees creaked. Squirrels chirped and birds stirred in their nests. An acorn fell to the ground. Pid heaved a sigh of relief and sat down. 
the twenty-first Grom expedition had landed safely. There was nothing to be done until morning, so Pid began to make plans. They had landed as close to the atomic power installation as they dared. Now they would have to get closer. Somehow, one of them had to get very near the reactor room in order to activate the displacer. Difficult, but Pid felt certain of success. After all, the Grom were strong on ingenuity. Strong on ingenuity, he thought bitterly, but terribly short of radioactives. That was another reason why this expedition was so important. There was little radioactive fuel left on any of the Grom worlds. Ages ago, the Grom had spent their store of radioactives in spreading throughout their neighboring worlds, occupying the ones that they could live on. Now, colonization barely kept up with the mounting birth rate. New worlds were constantly needed. This particular world, discovered in a scouting expedition, was needed. It suited the Grom perfectly, but it was too far away. They didn't have enough fuel to mount a conquering space fleet. Luckily, there was another way, a better way. Over the centuries, the Grom scientists had developed the Displacer. A triumph of identity engineering, the Displacer allowed mass to be moved instantaneously between any two linked points. One end was set up at Grom's sole atomic energy plant. The other end had to be placed in proximity to another atomic power source and activated. Diverted power then flowed through both ends, was modified, and modified again. Then, through the miracle of identity engineering, the Grom could step through from planet to planet, or pour through in a great overwhelming wave. It was quite simple. But twenty expeditions had failed to set up the Earth End Displacer. What had happened to them was not known for no Grom ship had ever returned to tell. Before dawn they crept through the woods, taking on the coloration of the plants around them. Their displacers pulsed feebly, sensing the nearness of atomic energy. A tiny, four-legged creature darted in front of them. Instantly, Gur grew four legs and a long, streamlined body and gave chase. Gur, come back here! Pid howled at the detector, throwing caution to the winds. Gur overtook the animal and knocked it down, he tried to bite it, but he had neglected to grow teeth. The animal jumped free and vanished into the underbrush. Gurr thrust out a set of teeth and bunched his muscles for another leap. Gurr! Reluctantly, the detector turned away. He loped silently back to Pid. I was hungry, he said. You were not, Pid said sternly. Was, Gurr mumbled, writhing with embarrassment. Pid remembered what the chief had told him. Gurr certainly did have hunter tendencies. He would have to watch him more closely. "'We'll have no more of that,' Pid said. "'Remember, the lure of exotic shapes is not sanctioned. Be content with the shape you were born to.' Gurr nodded and melted back into the underbrush. They moved on. At the extreme edge of the woods they could observe the atomic energy installation. Pid disguised himself as a clump of shrubbery, and Gurr formed himself into an old log. Ilg, after a moment's thought, became a young oak. The installation was in the form of a long, low building, surrounded by a metal fence. There was a gate, and guards in front of it. The first job, Pid thought, was to get past that gate. He began to consider ways and means. From the fragmentary reports of the survey parties, Pid knew that, in some ways, this race of men were like the Grom. They had pets, as the Grom did, and homes and children and a culture. The inhabitants were skilled mechanically, as were the Grom. But there were terrific differences also. The men were of fixed and immutable form, like stones or trees, and to compensate, their planet boasted a fantastic array of species, types, and kinds. This was completely unlike Grom, which had only eight distinct forms of animal life. And evidently, the men were skilled at detecting invaders, Pid thought, he wished he knew how the other expeditions had failed. It would make his job much easier. A man lurched past them on two incredibly stiff legs. Rigidity was evident in his every move. Without looking, he hurried past. I know, Gurr said, after the creature had moved away. I'll disguise myself as a man, walk through the gate to the reactor room, and activate my displacer. You can't speak their language, Pid pointed out. I won't speak at all. I'll ignore them. Look. Quickly, Gurr shaped himself into a man. That's not bad, Pid said. Gurr tried a few practice steps, copying the bumpy walk of the man. 
"'But I'm afraid it won't work,' Pid said. "'It's perfectly logical,' Gur pointed out. "'I know. Therefore the other expeditions must have tried it, and none of them came back.' There was no arguing that. Gur flowed back into the shape of a log. "'What, then?' he asked. "'Let me think,' Pid said. Another creature lurched past, on four legs instead of two. Pid recognized it as a dog, a pet of man. He watched it carefully. The dog ambled to the gate, head down, in no particular hurry. It walked through, unchallenged, and lay down in the grass. Hmm, Pid said. They watched. One of the men walked past and touched the dog on the head. The dog stuck out its tongue and rolled over on its side. I can do that, Gurr said excitedly. He started to flow into the shape of a dog. "'No, wait,' Pid said. "'We'll spend the rest of the day thinking it over. "'This is too important to rush into.' "'Gur subsided sulkily. "'Come on, let's move back,' Pid said. "'He and Gur started into the woods. "'Then he remembered Ilg. "'Ilg?' he called softly. "'There was no answer. "'Ilg!' "'What? "'Oh, yes,' an oak tree said, and melted into a bush. "'Sorry, what were you saying? "'We're moving back.' Pid said. Were you by any chance thinking? Oh, no, Ilg assured him. Just resting. Pid let it go at that. There was too much else to worry about. They discussed it for the rest of the day, hidden in the deepest part of the woods. The only alternative seemed to be man or dog. A tree couldn't walk past the gates, since that was not in the nature of trees. Nor could anything else and escape notice. Going as a man seemed too risky. They decided that Gur would sally out in the morning as a dog. Now get some sleep, Pid said. Obediently, his two crewmen flattened out, going immediately shapeless. But Pid had a more difficult time. Everything looked too easy. Why wasn't the atomic installation better guarded? Certainly the men must have learned something from the expeditions they had captured in the past. Or had they killed them without asking any questions? You couldn't tell what an alien would do. Was that open gate a trap? Wearily he flowed into a comfortable position on the lumpy ground. Then he pulled himself together hastily. He had gone shapeless. Comfort was not in the line of duty, he reminded himself, and firmly took a pilot's shape. But a pilot's shape wasn't constructed for sleeping on damp, bumpy ground. Pid spent a restless night thinking of ships and wishing he were flying one. He awoke in the morning tired and ill-tempered. He nudged Gurr. Let's get this over with, he said. Gurr flowed gaily to his feet. Come on, Ilg, Pid said angrily, looking around. Wake up. There was no reply. Ilg, he called. Still there was no reply. Help me look for him, Pid said to Gurr. He must be around here somewhere. Together they tested every bush, tree, log, and shrub in the vicinity. But none of them was Ilg. Pid began to feel a cold panic run through him. What could have happened to the radio man? Perhaps he decided to go through the gate on his own, Gurr suggested. Pid considered the possibility. It seemed unlikely. Ilg had never shown much initiative. He had always been content to follow orders. They waited, but midday came and there was still no sign of Ilg. We can't wait any longer, Pid said, and they started through the woods. Pid wondered if Ilg had tried to get through the gates on his own. Those quiet types often concealed a foolhardy streak. But there was nothing to show that Ilk had been successful. He would have to assume that the radio man was dead, or captured by the men. That left two of them to activate a displacer. And he still didn't know what had happened to the other expeditions. At the edge of the woods, Gur turned himself into a facsimile of a dog. Pitt inspected him carefully. A little less tail, he said. Gur shortened his tail. More ears. Gurr lengthened his ears. Now even them up. They became even. Pitt inspected the finished product. As far as he could tell, Gurr was perfect, from the tip of his tail to his wet, black nose. Good luck, Pitt said. Thanks. Cautiously, Gurr moved out of the woods, walking in the lurching style of dogs and men. At the gate, the guard called to him. Pitt held his breath. Gurr walked past the man, ignoring him. The man started to walk over. Gurr broke into a run. Pid shaped a pair of strong legs for himself, ready to dash if Gurr was caught. But the guard turned back to his gate. 
Gurr stopped running immediately and strolled quietly toward the main door of the building. Pid dissolved his legs with a sigh of relief, and then tensed again. The main door was closed. Pid hoped the radio man wouldn't try to open it. That was not in the nature of dogs. As he watched, another dog came running toward Gurr. Gurr backed away from him. The dog approached and sniffed. Gurr sniffed back. Then both of them ran around the building. That was clever, Pid thought. There was bound to be a door in the rear. He glanced up at the afternoon sun. As soon as the displacer was activated, the Grom armies would begin to pour through. By the time the men recovered from the shock, a million or more Grom troops would be here, weapons and all, with more following. The day passed slowly, and nothing happened. Nervously, Pid watched the front of the plant. It shouldn't be taking so long if Gur were successful. Late into the night he waited. Men walked in and out of the installation, and dogs barked around the gates. But Gur did not appear. Gur had failed. Ilg was gone. Only he was left. And still, he didn't know what had happened. By morning, Pid was in complete despair. He knew that the 21st Grom expedition to this planet was near the point of complete failure. Now it was all up to him. He saw that workers were arriving in great number, rushing through the gates. He decided to take advantage of the apparent confusion, and started to shape himself into a man. A dog walked past the woods where he was hiding. Hello, the dog said. It was Gurr. What happened? Pid asked with a sigh of relief. Why were you so long? Couldn't you get in? I don't know, Gurr said, wagging his tail. I didn't try. Pid was speechless. I went hunting, Gurr said complacently. This form is ideal for hunting, you know. I went out the rear gate with another dog. But the expedition! Your duty! I changed my mind, Gurr told him. You know, pilot, I never wanted to be a detector. But you were born a detector. That's true, Gurr said, but it doesn't help. I always wanted to be a hunter. Pid shook his entire body in annoyance. You can't, he said, very slowly, as one would explain to a grumbling. The hunter's shape is forbidden to you. Not here it isn't, Gurr said, still wagging his tail. Let's have no more of this, Pid said angrily. Get into that installation and set up your displacer. I'll try to overlook this heresy. No, Gurr said. I don't want the Grom here. They'd ruin it for the rest of us. He's right, a nearby oak tree said. Ilg, Pid gasped. Where are you? Branches stirred. I'm right here, Ilg said. I've been thinking. But you're cast. Pilot, Gurr said sadly. Why don't you wake up? Most of the people on Grom are miserable. Only custom makes us take the cast shape of our ancestors. Pilot, Ilg said, all Grom are born shapeless. And being born shapeless, all Grom should have freedom of shape, Gurr said. Exactly, Ilg said, but he'll never understand. Now, excuse me, I want to think. And the oak tree was silent. Pid laughed humorlessly. The men will kill you off, he said, just as they killed off all the other expeditions. No one from Grom has been killed. Gurr told him. The other expeditions are right here. Alive? Certainly. The men don't even know we exist. That dog I was hunting with is a Grom from the twelfth expedition. There are hundreds of us here, pilot. We like it. Pid tried to absorb it all. He had always known that the lower castes were lax in caste consciousness, but this was preposterous. This planet's secret menace was... freedom. Join us, pilot, Gurr said. We've got a paradise here. Do you know how many species there are on this planet? An uncountable number. There's a shape to suit every need. Pitt ignored them. Traitors. He'd do the job all by himself. So men were unaware of the presence of the Grom. Getting near the reactor might not be so difficult after all. The others had failed in their duty because they were of the lower castes, weak and irresponsible. Even the pilots among them must have been secretly sympathetic to the cult of shapelessness the chief had mentioned or the alien planet could never have swayed them. What shape to assume for his attempt? Pid considered. A dog might be best. Evidently dogs could wander pretty much where they wished. If something went wrong, Pid could change his shape to meet the occasion. The Supreme Council will take care of all of you, he snarled, and shaped himself into a small brown dog. I'm going to set up the displacer myself. He studied himself for a moment, bared his teeth at Gurr, 
and loped toward the gate. He loped for about ten feet and stopped in utter horror. The smells rushed at him from all directions, smells in a profusion and variety he had never dreamed existed, smells that were harsh, sweet, sharp, heavy, mysterious, overpowering, smells that terrified, alien and repulsive and inescapable. The odors of earth struck him like a blow. He curled his lips and held his breath. He ran on for a few steps and had to breathe again. He almost choked. He tried to remold his dog nostrils to be less sensitive. It didn't work. It wouldn't, so long as he kept the dog shape. An attempt to modify his metabolism didn't work either. All this in the space of two or three seconds. He was rooted in his tracks, fighting the smells, wondering what to do. Then the noises hit him. They were a constant and staggering roar, through which every tiniest whisper of sound stood out clearly and distinctly. Sounds upon sounds, more noise than he had ever heard before at one time in his life. The woods behind him had suddenly become a madhouse. Utterly confused, he lost control and became shapeless. He half ran, half flowed into a nearby bush. There he reshaped, obliterating the offending dog ears and nostrils with vicious strokes of his thoughts. The dog shape was out, absolutely. Such appalling sharpness of senses might be fine for a hunter such as Gurr. He probably gloried in them, but another moment of such impressions would have driven Pid the pilot mad. What now? He lay in the bush and thought about it, while gradually his mind threw off the last effects of the dizzying sensory assault. He looked at the gate. The men standing there evidently hadn't noticed his fiasco. They were looking in another direction. A man? Well, it was worth a try. Studying the men at the gate, Pid carefully shaped himself into a facsimile, a synthesis, actually, embodying one characteristic of that, another of this. He emerged from the side of the bush opposite the gate on his hands and knees. He sniffed the air, noting that the smells the man nostrils picked up weren't unpleasant at all. In fact, some of them were decidedly otherwise. It had just been the acuity of the dog nostrils, the number of smells they had detected, and the near brilliance with which they had done so, that had shocked him. Also, the sounds weren't half so devastating. Only relatively close sounds stood out. All else was an undetailed whispering. Evidently, Pid thought, it had been a long time since men had been hunters. He tested his legs, standing up and taking a few clumsy steps. Thud of foot on ground. Drag the other leg forward in a heavy arc. Thud. Rocking from side to side, he marched back and forth behind the bush. His arms flapped as he sought balance. His head wobbled on its neck until he remembered to hold it up. Head up, eyes down. He missed seeing a small rock. His heel turned on it. He sat down hard. The ankle hurt. Pid curled his man lips and crawled back into the bush. The man shape was too unspeakably clumsy. It was offensive to plod one step at a time. Body held rigidly upright, arms wobbling. There had been a deluge of sense impressions in the dog shape. There was dull, stiff, half-alive inadequacy to the man shape. Besides, it was dangerous now that Pid thought it over, as well as distasteful. He couldn't control it properly. It wouldn't look right. Someone might question him. There was too much about men he didn't, couldn't, know. The planting of the displacer was too important a thing for him to fumble again. Only luck had kept him from being seen during the sensory onslaught. The displacer in his body pouch pulsed and tugged, urging him to be on his way toward the distant reactor room. Grimly, Pid let out the last breath he had taken with his man lungs and dissolved the lungs. What shape to take? Again he studied the gate, the men standing beside it, the building beyond in which was the all-important reactor. A small shape was needed, a fast one, an unobtrusive one. He lay and thought. The bush rustled above him. A small brown shape had fluttered down to light on a twig. It hopped to another twig, twittering. Then it fluttered off in a flash and was gone. That, Pid thought, was it. A sparrow that was not a sparrow rose from the bush a few moments later. An observer would have seen it circle the bush, diving, hedge-hopping, even looping, as if practicing all maneuvers possible to sparrows. Pid tensed his shoulder muscles, inclined his wings. He slipped off to the right, approached the bush at what seemed breakneck speed, though he knew this was only because of his small size. 
At the last second he lifted his tail. Not quite quickly enough. He swooped up and over the top of the bush, but his legs brushed the top leaves, his beak went down, and he stumbled in air for a few feet back forward. He blinked beady eyes as if at a challenge. Back toward the bush at a fine clip, again up and over, this time cleanly. He chose a tree, zoomed into its network of branches, wove a web of flight, working his way around and around the trunk, over and under branches that flashed before him, through crotches with no more than a feather's breadth to spare. At last he rested on a low branch and found himself chirping in delight. The tree extruded a feeler from the branch he sat on and touched his wings and tail. Interesting, said the tree. I'll have to try that shape some time. Ilg. Traitor, hissed Pid, growing a mouth in his chest to hiss it. And then he did something that caused Ilg to exclaim in outrage. Pid flew out of the woods, over the underbrush and across the open space toward the gate. This body would do the trick. This body would do anything. He rose in a matter of a few sparrow heartbeats to an altitude of a hundred feet. From here the gate, the men, the building were small, sharp shapes against a green-brown mat. Pid found that he could see not only with unaccustomed clarity, but with a range of vision that astonished him. To right and to left he could see far into the hazy blue of the sky, and the higher he rose the farther he could see. He rose higher. The displacer pulsed, reminding him of the job he had to do. He stiffened his wings and glided, regretfully putting aside his desires to experiment with this wonderful shape, at least for the present. After he planted the displacer, he would go off by himself for a while and do it just a little more, somewhere where Ilg and Gur would not see him, before the Grom army arrived and the invasion began. He felt a tiny twinge of guilt as he circled. It was evil to want to keep this alien flying shape any longer than was absolutely necessary to the performance of his duty. It was a device of the shapeless one. But what had Ilg said? All Grom are born shapeless. It was true. Grom children were amorphous, until old enough to be instructed in the cast shape of their ancestors. Maybe it wasn't too great a sin to alter your shape, then, just once in a long while. After all, one must be fully aware of the nature of evil in order to meaningfully reject it. He had fallen lower in circling. The displacer pulse had strengthened. For some reason it irritated him. He drove higher on strong wings, circled again. Air rushed past him, a smooth whispering flow, pierced by his beak, streaming invisibly past his sharp eyes, moving along his body in tiny turbulences that moved his feathers against his skin. It occurred to him, or rather struck him with considerable force, that he was satisfying a longing of his pilot cast that went far deeper than piloting. He drove powerfully with his wings, felt Tonus across his back, shot forward and up. He thought of the controls of his ship. He imagined flowing into them, becoming part of them as he had so often done, and for the first time in his life the thought failed to excite him. No machine could compare with this. What he would give to have wings of his own. Get from my sight, shapeless one. The displacer must be planted, activated. All Grom depended on him. He eyed the building, far below. He would pass over it. The displacer would tell him which window to enter. Which window was so near the reactor that he could do his job before the men even knew he was about. He started to drop lower, and the hawk struck. It had been above him. His first inkling of danger was the sharp pain of talons in his back, and the stunning blow of a beak across his head. Dazed, he let his back go shapeless. His body substance flowed from the grasp of the talons. He dropped a dozen feet and resumed sparrow shape, hearing an astonished squawk from the attacker. He banked and looked up. The hawk was eyeing him. Talon spread again. The sharp beak gaped. The hawk swooped. Pid had to fight as a bird, naturally. He was four hundred feet above the ground. So he became an impossibly deadly bird. He grew to twice the size of the hawk. He grew a foot-long beak with a double razor's edge. He grew talons like six-inch scimitars. His eyes gleamed a red challenge. The hawk broke flight, squalling in alarm. Frantically, tail down and widespread, it thundered its wings and came to a dead stop six feet from Pid. Looking thoughtfully at Pid, it allowed itself to plummet. It fell a hundred feet, spread its wings, stretched its neck, and flew off so hastily that its wings became blurs. Pid saw no reason to pursue it. Then, after a moment, he did. 
He glided, keeping the hawk in sight, thoughts racing, feeling the newness, the power, the wonder of freedom of shape. Freedom. He did not want to give it up. The bird shape was wondrous. He would experiment with it. Later he might tire of it for a time and assume another, a crawling or running shape, or even a swimming one. The possibilities for excitement, for adventure, for fulfillment and simple sensual pleasure were endless. Freedom of shape was, obviously, now that you thought on it, the grand birthright. And the caste system was artificial, obviously. A device for political and priestly benefit, obviously. Go away, shapeless one. This does not concern you. He rose to a thousand feet, two thousand, three. The displacer's pulse grew feebler and finally vanished. At four thousand feet, he released it and watched it spin downward, vanish into a cloud. Then he set out after the hawk, which was now only a dot on the horizon. He would find out how the hawk had broken flight as it had, skidded on air. He wanted to do that too. There were so many things he wanted to learn about flying. In a week, he thought, he should be able to duplicate all the skill that millennia had evolved into birds. Then his new life would really begin. He became a torpedo shape with huge wings, and sped after the hawk. End of Keep Your Shape by Robert Sheckley The Last Supper by T.D. Ham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Nocetti. The Last Supper by T. D. Ham. Hampered as she was by the child in her arms, the woman was running less fleetly now. A wave of exultation swept over Goldran, drowning out the uneasy feeling of guilt at disobeying orders. The instructions were mandatory and concise. No capture must be attempted individually. In the event of sighting any form of human life, the ship must be notified immediately. All small craft must be back at the landing space not later than one hour before takeoff. Anyone not so reporting will be presumed lost. Goldran thought uneasily of the great seas of snow and ice sweeping inexorably toward each other since the earth had reversed on its axis in the great catastrophe a millennium ago. Now, summer and winter alike brought paralyzing gales and blizzards, heralded by the sleety snow in which the woman's skin-clad feet had left the tracks which led to discovery. His trained anthropologist's mind speculated avidly over the little they had gotten from the younger of the two men found nearly a week before, nearly frozen and half-starved. The older man had succumbed almost at once. The other, in the most primitive sign language, had indicated that, of several humans living in the caves to the west, only he and the other had survived to flee some mysterious terror. Goldren felt a throb of pity for the woman and her child, left behind by the men, no doubt, as a hindrance. But what a stroke of fortune that there should be left a male and female of the race to carry the seed of Terra to another planet, and what a triumph if he, Goldran, should be the one to return at the eleventh hour with the prize. No need of calling for help. This was no armed war party, but the most defenseless being in the universe, a mother burdened with a child. Goldran put on another burst of speed. His previous shouts had served only to spur the woman to greater efforts. Surely there was some magic word that had survived even the centuries of illiteracy, something equivalent to the bread and salt of all illiterate peoples. Cupping his hands to his mouth, he shouted, Food! Food! Ahead of him, the woman turned her head, leaped lightly in mid-stride, and went on, slowing a little, but still running doggedly. Goldran's pulse leaped. He yelled again, Food! The instant that his foot touched the yielding surface of the trap, he knew that he had met defeat. As his body crashed down on the fire-sharpened stakes, he knew, too, 
the terror from which the last men of the human race had fled. Above him, the woman looked down, her teeth gleaming wolfishly. She pointed down into the pit, spoke exultantly to the child. Food, said the last woman on earth. End of The Last Supper by T. D. Ham. Recording by David Nocetti. DavidNocetti.com. Lease to Doomsday by Lee Archer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lease to Doomsday by Lee Archer. It was the lack of sense in the ad that made him go back to it again. He was having his breakfast coffee in the cafeteria next to the Midtown Hotel where he lived. A classified section of the New York Times was spread before him. Wanted. Live wire real estate broker. No selling. 30 to 40. Room 657 Silver's Building. 9 through 12, Monday morning. The ad made no sense for several reasons. One, you just don't go around advertising for brokers with four pages of them in the classified phone book. Two, how can one be a live wire broker without having to sell? Kevin Muldoon shook his head. Just no damn sense. The Silver Building. Hmm not too far off. He looked at his strap watch. Fifteen minutes of nine. He could walk it in that time. Don't be a fool, he said to himself. It's obviously a come-on of some kind. He got up, paid his check, and went out. It wasn't until he was on Third Avenue that he was conscious he had started to go across town when his office was in the opposite direction. He smiled wryly. Might as well investigate, he thought. Can't do any harm, and it won't take long. There were four others waiting in the small anteroom. The outer door bore no legend other than the room number, and the inner door was blank altogether. Muldoon made a quick appraisal of those waiting. Three were obviously past middle age, the fourth about Muldoon's age. The inner door opened and Muldoon looked up. A tall man came out first, a man in his early sixties perhaps. Immediately behind him came a slightly shorter man, but very heavy and with a head that was bald as a billiard ball. The older man marched straight to the door, opened it, and went out without a second look back. The fat man looked around, his face beaming in a wide smile, eyes almost closed behind fleshy lids. And now who's next? He asked. The one who was about Muldoon's age stepped forward. The fat man motioned for the other to precede him. The door closed. Not more than a minute went by, and the door opened again in the same act as before with the older man who'd gone through. And now who's next? The fat man asked. Muldoon noted even the inflection was the same. So it went with the three who were left, until it was Muldoon's turn, and now there were six others beside himself also waiting to be interviewed. It was a squarish room, simply furnished, with a couple of desks set side by side with a narrow space between them. A chair was set up facing the desks, obviously meant for one to be interviewed. Seated behind one of the desks was the twin of the man now coming to seat himself at the other desk. Their smiles were identical as they waited for Muldoon to make himself comfortable. For a moment there was a blank silence. Muldoon studied them, and they, smiling still, studied him. Muldoon broke the silence. You know, Muldoon said, your ad didn't make sense to me. The twins hunched forward slightly at their desks, their eyes brightened in anticipation. No, said the one who had been waiting for Muldoon. Why? With some four pages of brokers in the classified directory, you don't have to advertise for one and a live wire broker gets that reputation as a salesman. Without selling, the wire is dead. The twins beamed at each other. Evan, said the one to the left, I think we found our man. Will you go out and tell those waiting? They waited for the twin to return. I am Robert Rieger, my brother, Evan, said the first twin. Muldoon introduced himself. There was no handshaking. You are right about the ad, Robert Rieger said. We worded it that way for a reason. We wanted a man of quick intelligence. Mind you now, we do want a broker, and one who will do no selling. The live wire part was my brother Evan's thought. He does sometimes have clever ideas. Robert stopped to beam at his twin. Just now, Robert returned to Muldoon. I won't go into a full discussion of our plans. Briefly, however, we are buyers. Buyers, we hope, of a particular area. 
because of what we have in mind to do. We would rather it was done quietly and without any publicity. Had we engaged in the services of a large agency, this would not be possible. Or, if I may coin a phrase, the trumpet must blow strongly to announce the coming of genius. He smiled, stroked his chin, looked up at the ceiling, and his lips moved silently as if he enjoyed repeating the phrase. I like that, Robert, Evan said. Yes, I thought it was good, Robert said. They both looked at Muldoon. Muldoon said nothing. The twins sighed audibly in unison. Robert's lips came forward in a pout. The look of pouting cherub, Muldoon thought. One trying to look stern and only succeeding in looking naughty childish. Muldoon suddenly knew of whom the twins reminded him. Twin Charles Lawton's without hair. You are free to work out for us? Robert asked. With you? Muldoon said. I have the license. He gave them a quick smile as if to lessen the sharpness of the tone he had used. A broker acts for a client in the purchase or sale of property. He can't be employed by them. Of course, Robert said quickly. I did not mean to imply any other action. Now suppose you tell us briefly about yourself. Muldoon gave them a thumbnail sketch of his career. He noted their pleased look that he was a one-man agency. At the conclusion, Robert stood up and came around the desk. He thrust a hand at Muldoon. Like shaking hands with a piece of warm dough, Muldoon thought. I do believe, Robert said as he placed a heavy arm around Muldoon's shoulder and walked him to the door, that we shall have a mutually happy relationship. You will not be unrewarded money-wise. He opened the door, paused, still with his arm around Muldoon, and looked steadily into Muldoon's eyes. Yes, I think there will be mutual benefits in our relationship. Now, in conclusion, will you pick us up at this office tomorrow morning at nine? Muldoon nodded. Good. Then bye now, Mr. Muldoon. And thanks so much for coming by in answer to our ad. The answer to an irritating thought came to Muldoon while he was waiting for an elevator to take him to the ground floor. He knew where he had seen the same kind of look as was in Robert Rieger's eyes when they had parted. In the eyes of a cat, Muldoon had once seen toying with a mouse the cat had caught. Dina Savory was a redhead, a green-eyed redhead with a kind of patrician look about her face that came off very well in photographs that they took of her. Dina was a model and made three times the money Kevin Muldoon made. It had always been a sore point between them and more than once the reason for their worst quarrels. She was also the worst cook in New York. Monday evenings were spent in Dina's small apartment on East 56th Street, and she usually cooked dinner for Muldoon. Invariably, it was steak. Dina had no imagination when it comes to food. Even in restaurants, she ordered one or another kind of steak. They were together on the couch. She stretched full length, her head in Muldoon's lap. He was telling her about the Rieger twins and what had happened in the morning. His hands caressed her lightly as she spoke, now across her cheeks, now more intimately. I don't do you them, honey, he said, as if in recapitulation. The Robert twin, for instance. You will not be rewarded money-wise. Madison Avenue in 19th century English. She gently took his hand from where he had seemed to find most comfort and put it up to her cheek. What's the difference? she asked, so long as there's money in it. Broker's commission, he said. No more, no less. You've been getting so much of that lately. Mm, no. Okay, then. Stop fighting it. What do you care what kind of English they use or whether they use sign language? The buck, kid. The buck. Dina, Muldoon said gravely. You have the grubbing soul of a pawnbroker or real estate agent, he added. He bent his head and kissed her lips. Her lips opened to his with a familiar warmth, a hunger for him which never failed to thrill. This time she did not remove his hands when it returned. Kevy, baby, darling, oh, my darling, she whispered. Strange, he thought, that at a moment like this I should be thinking of those fat twins. Muldoon hated the pirate prices of midtown parking lots, and so was late. It had taken him ten minutes to find parking space for the Plymouth. As he started to open the door of room 657, he heard the voice of one of the twins. The words or sounds were in a language completely foreign to him. He thought to knock, but changed his mind. To knock would have made it obvious he had been listening. He barged right in. The twins were in the anteroom. 
Muldoon got the impression that they knew he had heard them, and an even stronger impression that the fact was of no importance. That bothered him for some reason. Ah, there you are, the twin to the left said. Evan was wondering whether you would show up, but I told him he was putting himself to useless aggravation. That damned mixed-up phrase again, Muldoon thought. Took a little time to find a parking space, he said. Shall we be off, then? Robert asked. All right with me, Muldoon replied. It was another odd thing. Evan Rieger seemed to have so very little to say. Their destination was a place halfway down the island. Muldoon's brow had lifted when they gave him the area. So far as he knew, there hadn't been any development in the area. It was just a bit too far off the highways and the rail lines for housing developments, and even more badly located for industrial requirements. He wondered what the devil they had in mind out there. Traffic was light, and the drive took little more than an hour and a half on the main highway, and another fifteen minutes of blacktop side road before Evan told him to turn left here, onto a rutted path off the blacktop. The path led through some scrub growth that ended on the edge of an acre or so of dump heap. Rusted heaps of broken cars were scattered about. A foul odor came from the left as though garbage, too, had been dumped and left to rot. There was a flat, one-storied wooden shack close by to which Evan directed him to drive up to. Evan produced a key and opened the door to the shack. There was a partition separating the place neatly into two sections. There were a couple of straight black wooden chairs and a leather sofa in the near room. The door to the other room was closed. Sit down, Muldoon, Robert Rieger said. He waited for Muldoon to make himself comfortable on the sofa. Thing continued. First time we've ever been out here during the day. But Evan's sense of direction is unfailing. He shook his head, smiled brightly. Ah, oh, well, we must each have some factor to make for validity of existence, eh? I don't follow, Muldoon said. No matter. Now, to the business at hand. I wanted you to see the area involved. Evan, the plot plan, please. To Muldoon's surprise, Evan Rieger went into the next room and returned after a moment with the plot plan of the lower third of the island. He gave it to Muldoon, who spread it at his feet. The red-penciled area I have marked off, Robert Rieger said, is what we'll be concerned with. As you notice, the dump and this shack are at the approximate center. What I have in mind to do is buy all the land in the marked-off area. Buy it? You seem surprised. Shocked would be the better word. Have you any idea what this could cost? You've marked off an area approximately a square mile. Even out here that would run into millions. And once news got around that someone was buying parcels of this size, well, you'd have more publicity than you might want. About the cost, we won't worry. There will be enough money. But the attendant publicity could mean not being able to get the land we want. Is that correct? Could be. Suppose we get options, or leases on these pieces. That was a good phrase, Evan broke in unexpectedly. Don't you think so, Robert? Yes, Robert said sharply. He seemed to have suddenly lost his smile. He gave Evan a hard look from under down-drawn brows. He turned to Muldoon. We are renting this, this tumble-down structure. A two-year lease. Huh. I see your point. Spending millions in some buying move would make unneeded difficulties. No options to buy, but at least for the present. Evan, the list of names, please. Evan didn't have to go anywhere for the list. He had it with him. Muldoon looked over. There were 33 names, including the county and the state. Well, Robert asked, I'll have to know what you want to lease it for. The names or names of corporations and so forth. Will my own name do? It will, but you can go into the county court and register a business name under your own. What they call a DBA name, doing business as name. Register as many as you wish. Don't cost a great deal, or form a corporation, you and your brother. No, let the leases come under my own name. As for what I intend doing, well, I intend to concrete surface of the entire area. A square mile of concrete? Yes, there is a government plan to use this end of the island for a huge missile depot. They will have to come to me. Pretty shrewd, Muldoon thought. That is, if it's true. All right, Muldoon asked. When do you want me to start? Right now. That was one more reason for bringing you out here. Evan, will you get the briefcase, please? Once more, Evan Rieger went into the other room. 
and closed the door carefully behind him when he came out. He handed the briefcase to Muldoon. You may open it, Robert said. Muldoon's fingers became suddenly nerveless, and he dropped the briefcase. It was crammed with money, packets of hundred-dollar bills. There are fifty packets of hundred-dollar bills, totaling a million dollars, Robert said. What the hell do you want me to do? Carry this case around with me? Muldoon asked. No, it will remain here. I merely wanted to show you I will be able to stand behind any price you may have to meet. From now on, report here no matter what time, and since time has a definite value in this matter, do not stand upon it. I like that, Evan said suddenly. That was good, Robert. Muldoon nodded. Evan had a value too, the same value any yes man has. But it bothered Muldoon. This just wasn't the way of twins, at least none he knew. Well, one thing was certain, the Riegers had the ready cash. This may take some time, Muldoon said. Weeks, certainly, maybe months, the county and state alone. We don't have that much time, Robert broke in. Evan must return in ten days. Return? Where? Muldoon asked. It was as if Robert hadn't heard. The state and county properties are small areas and on the very edge. Suppose we forget about them for the time being, work on the private parties. Anything you say, but it may still take weeks. Then don't quibble. Lease at any price. If a show of cash is necessary, let me know. Now I think you'd better start. Good luck, Muldoon. It was a Wednesday at night before Muldoon saw Dina Savory again. Nor had he seen the Rieger twins since leaving them on Monday morning. Dina and Muldoon seldom saw each other during the middle of the week. They were her busy days, and she needed the nights for a complete rest. But he had called her and asked to see her. They were at dinner in a small Italian place close to her apartment. He had briefly brought her up to date on what had happened since she had seen him last, and was at the moment finishing the last of the lasagna he had ordered. They're phonies, honey. Real phonies, he said. I bet my last buck on that. She was looking at the last piece of steak on her plate. With an almost defiant gesture, she speared it and put it in her mouth. At a girl, he said. Mind your own business, she said. How do you mean they're phonies? I spent all Monday investigating them. A fine way to make a dollar, she said. What do you care who they are? He gave her a knowing smile. That's my fat-headed girl. Like to visit me in a nice jail, wouldn't you? One with a prestige address, of course, let me tell you. They rented that shack and the dump heap next to it for a pretty fancy figure. Robert Rieger said they were going to do printing in the shack. They paid it in full for the two years' rental and nice crisp hundred-dollar bills. I get it. They were phony, she exulted. How can you be so stupid? I know. For you it's easy. Of course the bills were genuine, but the printing business. What were they going to print with? Typewriters? Another thing. There's no business record I could find of them. They're not listed. So how did they get a million dollars? And Robert said more. Report here, no matter at the time. I don't get it. I drove them out. There was no garage, no car I could see, and the place is miles from food. How do they live out there? Maybe they have friends who picked them up, Dina said. Maybe. Robert also said there was a rumor of something about the government going to use the area for a missile depot. I tried to run it down. Nothing. Which proves nothing, she said. True, but I couldn't even smell smoke. No, the whole thing just smells bad. So I think I'm going back there to tell them to forget it. Oh, don't be an idiot, she said. This is your big chance to make some real money, get a reputation, and because you're chicken, you're going to throw it up. I won't get into anything crooked, his voice rose. The way you're thinking, you couldn't follow a straight line. They can't draw a straight line. Will you do what you want? Only next time I have to pay for a dinner. Don't give me that martyred look. Okay, okay. What do you want for dessert, Spumoni? After this, bicarbonate. Very funny. And for the first time in several years, she did not kiss him goodnight when they parted. He turned off the blacktop and started down the rutted path. He switched the headlights off about halfway to the shack and parked it a hundred or so yards away from it and walked the rest. The shack was dark. Instead of knocking, Muldoon walked around the back and peered through the single window at the rear. He could see nothing. Now isn't this just dandy, he thought. Drive all the way out here and nobody's at home. Damn. He went around to the front and started back to the car. His attention was caught by a greenish glow of light from the far end of the dump heap. 
His curiosity aroused, Muldoon warily made his way through the metal litter until he was close enough to make out the source of the light. It came from the center of a shallow area that had been cleared of rubble. A rusted, misshapen mass of metal lay in the center of the cleared space. The greenish glow was coming from an opening in the mass. Muldoon crept closer until he was able to make out details. Not too many, but enough to give him the idea of the size and general shape of the thing. But what really held him were the figures of Robert and Evan Rieger. He saw them quite distinctly. One of the twins was bent over a machine of some sort. There were levers, gears, and rollers mounted on a webbed platform no larger than a rather oversized typewriter. Muldoon's eyes went wide at the sight of the greenbacks coming in a steady stream from the interior of the machine and falling into a box at the side. He could see very little else that was in the room other than the brother of the twin at the machine. He was on the far side of it, fiddling with something hidden. Muldoon stared in fascination for another minute, then carefully made his way back to the car. He had parked it within the growth of scrub trees and bushes. He started it, turning the headlights on, and drove slowly out to the open and up to the shack. He honked his horn loudly a couple of times and got out of the car and walked up to the shack and tried the door. It was closed. Presently, the figures of Evan and Robert Rieger came into view from the direction of the dump heap. Muldoon's figure was outlined in the glow of the headlights. Muldoon noticed a briefcase one of them was carrying. Ah, there, Muldoon. Muldoon had recognized Robert's voice. Hello, Mr. Rieger. Thought I'd come by and let you know how I've been doing. Evan, who was carrying the briefcase, unlocked the door and switched on the light. The other two followed him into the room. Robert Rieger motioned for Muldoon to take the sofa. Evan went into the other room. Well, my boy, Robert said heartily, how's it going? Slowly, Muldoon said casually, but the first of this sort of operation has to go that way, kind of feel things out, if you know what I mean. Of course. How does it look? I think it's going to go all right. I've got plans. Splendid. Do you need money? Yes, about ten thousand. Evan, do bring the case out, Robert called loudly. In a couple of seconds, Evan Rieger appeared. He brought the briefcase to his brother, turned, and went back into the other room without saying anything. He walked slowly and stiffly, his feet slapping heavily on the bare boards. "'What's wrong with him?' Muldoon asked. Robert Rieger was pulling money from the briefcase. He looked up with an expressionless face. "'Nothing. You said ten thousand? "'Yes.' Rieger passed two of the packets to Muldoon. "'Sure you won't need more?' Muldoon put the money away got up from the sofa and started to the door. No, just what I need. Uh, I'll see you on Friday night. Fine, and don't forget, we must get all this done quickly. I won't forget. Robert Rieger waited till the sound of the Plymouth was no longer heard, then he went into the other room. Other than for two army cots, the room was empty. Evan was stretched full length on one of the cots. You're certain he knows? Evan asked. Yes, I saw him on the Vizio but he couldn't see all the interior. No, just the duplicating machine. We must get rid of it tonight. What do you think he will do? What can he do? He knows nothing. The money is genuine, and with the destruction of the machine, he can't prove anything. Nevertheless, it might be the wisest course to get rid of him. We might have been too clever with that advertisement. Possibly, but we must move quickly then. I must leave this planet in seven days now, and we must have this area under lease by then. Three musts. Robert smiled thinly. We will, if not through Muldoon, then through another means. When you return in a year with the space fleet, you will find the landing area we need. And after that? They smiled at each other. We said we would not fail. The planet will fall to our weapons like ripe fruit from a tree. But first I must return to tell them, Evan said. If I do not return, they will know we have failed and will seek another planet. We won't fail, Robert reiterated. Right now, let's get back to the spaceship and the duplicating machine. Muldoon spent a busy Thursday, a news brief in the Times financial section which told of a public utility wanting island property gave him an idea for one thing. He spent all morning bringing the idea to a head. After he had verified the truth of the item, then, after a late lunch, he went to the Treasury Department's headquarters and spent a couple of hours with the head of a local investigation department. He was quite pleased with himself by nightfall as he headed out to the island. This time, he parked his car at a considerable distance from the shack. There were lights on this night. He walked boldly up and knocked at the door. It opened wide, and the thick figure of one of the twins darkened the opening. Well, Mr. Muldoon, I did not think to see you till Friday. 
I thought I'd come and see you tonight, Muldoon said as he stepped into the room. I didn't hear the car. Oh, parked it back a bit, Muldoon said. He turned toward the other twin as the inner door opened. Hello. Hello. You know, Evan, Robert said. I'm rather glad Muldoon stopped by tonight. We might as well conclude our business with him now. An excellent idea, Robert. Excellent. What do you mean? Muldoon asked. I no longer am acting for you? Not for us, for yourself. I'm afraid your services, in any capacity, will no longer be needed. Muldoon caught the undercurrent of menace in Robert's voice. It told him they were not only suspicious, but ready to act on it. He started to edge towards the door, but Robert suddenly reached out and took his arm. There was power in the fat man's grip. Evan moved swiftly for his size and took up a position before the door, which he kicked shut. Muldoon twisted sharply and was free of the other's grip. He stepped back a couple of paces. What the hell's this all about? Come now, Muldoon, Robert said softly. You didn't think your prying went unobserved last night. So I was nosy. But what's the rough stuff you're trying to pull? Merely making sure your curiosity will end tonight. Muldoon took a couple of more retreating paces. You mean you're going to get rid of me? Well, maybe you will and maybe you won't, but even if you do... A smile broke through the grim lips of the twin, threatening Muldoon. You mean the duplicating machine? Just another piece of rusted scrap among the rest of the junk. Muldoon paled. The evidence he was going to need. Gone. And of course, the money is genuine. We made sure of it. Ink, paper, everything. We made sure of it long ago. It will be a pity you won't be here to see how efficient we can really be. But the rest of the planet will know. As soon as Evan returns. Muldoon's mind was working swiftly. You got rid of the machine, but what about the junk shop it was in? I bet there are more important things there. Indeed there are, but no one will find it. It's just another rusted piece of large junk to them. It was then that Muldoon made his move. He lashed out with a fist. The blow staggered Robert, and Muldoon was crashing his shoulder against the inner door. It burst inward, but before he could get through, Robert grabbed him. The whole side of Muldoon's face went numb as Robert crashed his fist against his jaw. Muldoon knew he didn't stand a chance in a straight-up fight. Not with these two. Robert's hands were reaching for him now. Muldoon grabbed one of the hands with both of his, twisted outwards as he grasped two fingers in each hand. Robert's face went putty gray as the bone snapped. Muldoon no longer cared about fair play. His knee came up where it could do most damage, and Robert sank groveling to the floor. Muldoon whirled. Too late, the world exploded into a thousand flashes of pain-filled lights. He went crashing backward into the wall. Evan hit him again before he stumbled blindly away from the terrible fist. Let me kill him, Robert groaned. Muldoon pulled himself up from the pain-filled world he had been sent to. There seemed to be two Evans facing him, then there was only one. A twisted grin came to Muldoon's lips. Come ahead, you rat, he mumbled. Evan came forward, and as swift as an adder, Muldoon kicked him just below the kneecap. Evan screamed and collapsed. Muldoon staggered out of the way of the falling body, only to fall into the clutches of Robert's sudden reaching fingers. He fell to the floor. Robert tried to get his good hand up to Muldoon's throat. Muldoon beat at the thick face with both hands, but the other seemed not to feel the pounding fists. Slowly, the fingers managed to reach their goal. Muldoon felt the darkness of death closing over him as his breath became a tortured, dying gasp. He had found Robert's face came gently over it until his thumb pressed on one eyeball, and Robert screamed as the thumb became a hooked instrument to blind him. Muldoon rolled away from the other, staggering somehow erect, but knew his strength was gone. He couldn't make it to the door, and now Evan had him. And the door burst open and men poured into the room. Muldoon recognized only one, the head of the treasurer's investigation department, before he blacked out. Dina Savory stroked his forehead gently. Does it hurt much, baby? The nurse had left them alone when Dina came into the hospital room. Not now, Muldoon said. What are they going to do to those men? She asked. Oh, twenty years, according to Phillips. Counterfeiting, you know, carries heavy, heavy penalties. But I thought the money was good. After all, they had paid rent with C-notes. A slip-up on the bank's part. You see, they made one mistake. The machine they had turned out perfect bills. Everyone with the same serial number. Dina's eyes widened. And the junk shop, or whatever it was, she said. 
I thought I'd let that well enough alone. You see, I took care of that during the day. The twins, being criminals, had automatically broken their lease. They also made it possible for me to change clients. Well, there's going to be a huge tank covering that dump and shack, a tank holding an awful lot of natural gas. I got together with the owner of the property and the utility people yesterday afternoon and worked out a deal. They're going to dump all that junk into the ocean. I'm sorry about the other night, she said suddenly. Is that how you say you're sorry? he asked. Uh-huh, she said, as he reached for her. There's a time and place for that. Promise. Her lips agreed. End of Lease to Doomsday by Lee Archer Recording by Caleb Toll